Changing minds isn't about presenting ideas. It's about influencing with a good story. Hello and welcome to Season 7 of the Boomprinter Asia podcast and I'm your host, Krista Good. My mission is to uncover the stories and strategies of Asian women entrepreneurs in Asia to help you and inspire you as you navigate your own business journey. This episode is sponsored by Redbox Studio. Today, I'm speaking to an Indian entrepreneur based in Hong Kong. Sundari Mukherjee is the CEO of Soundbites 11. Her company is an organizational consultancy that focuses on working with leaders and teams to harness the power of storytelling to drive business outcomes. In our conversation today, Sundari shares invaluable insights into the art of business storytelling emphasizing its role as a dynamic tool in the leadership toolbox. She believes in equipping leaders to connect effectively with their teams so that they are able to influence action that drives transformation and change. We explore Sundari's journey starting from Chennai to Bahrain and finally to Hong Kong, where she has been for the past 17 years. We discuss her experience as a mother climbing the corporate ladder to taking deliberate pauses for introspection. In this episode, we also spoke about her personal strategies, including the concept of a personal board of directors, her involvement in sports and hobbies, like table tennis and pottery, and her thoughts on personal branding. As Sundari says, changing minds isn't about presenting ideas. It's about influencing with a good story. Hello, Sundari. Welcome to Womenpreneur Asia. Hi, Krista. Really lovely to be here with you today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Sundari Mm. is in a business that is really unique and really something that resonates very well with me too. So Sundari, could you explain a little bit about what you do and and how you started your business? I had a typical corporate life and I think going through that, it really made me realise that while domain expertise is important, You need to go deeper into a particular domain as you start your career and trajectory, whatever that domain is. Over a period of time, it's about working with people and how effectively are you working with people. And that sort of reinforced the fact that putting human at the center at the risk of using a cliched phrase is really important. And how can you as leader really do that? How can you give room for people, for their individuality? in the working environment, nourishing them, while at the same time building capability and capacity for them to be leaders themselves as they go along. So what I realized is that you need to work in the area of really nourishing human beings for them to do their best jobs, for them to feel good about themselves in the workplace. So that thought formed and you know how it is. It's not like, you know, it's not like you think of this idea and voila, Eureka or whatever, and then the business forms itself, right? It's a lot of these ideas growing on each other over a period of time. When I started talking to leaders and discussing, you know, when I was doing my leadership consulting practice, a lot of the conversations were around, you know, we want our people to connect with our stakeholders much better. We want our sales folks to connect with our customers much better. Some of our sales folks are talking like they're brochures. They should be talking human. So how can we get them to do that? And that reiterated the importance of what I call is the three C's, which is communication, communication, communication. (laughs) And working on that really then evolved this process of how do you create a context? How do you create the communication piece? And how do you help people conceptualize this whole thing and so I started working at what I call the big hairy audacious goal of helping leaders be more human at the workplace build their personal brand and help others do that too but using storytelling as a tool to drive that and when did you start that I'm sure the journey must not have been easy but when do you start that Especially in a place like Hong Kong, while communication is always obviously important for any job, any practice, anything, Hong Kong is the finance capital. It's also in that way, very transactional. Just get the work done and go. 
no lingering no small talk you have to call it small talk the connection is important but it's always oriented towards getting the work done so in 2014 when i was still working on leadership development area it just struck me that you know this is just not the missing jigsaw piece i felt i was connecting a lot of the things on the leadership side but something was missing and i was looking at these practices that were going around around the world on you know what is making more effective leaders how do ceos when you look at ceos how do they discover their values how do they communicate their values how do they contextualize it for the team and that's when i heard more about business storytelling as a tool now you can have a lot of tools in the toolbox and you need a lot of them especially when you're looking at leadership positions and all that it's not one or the other so the idea was not to make people like the jk rawlings of the world but to help them use this as a tool to connect and have a engagement better so the leaders can use this to influence action to connect people to strategy otherwise strategy can be very abstract it, it's a 30000 feet view right it may be clear to you because you've thought about it in your head but when you actually communicate it back it's coming like bullet points on a presentation people may not feel that connect so how do you take that narrative and communicate it to various units various divisions various departments in a way that they can understand it in their context so just for example if we say something like digitization i want my company to be we are going to be the best digitally enabled company big strategy great line which is but, a lot of uh, which is a lot but people really don't understand it right understand it i need to know what's in it for me how is it going to transform my job role from what i'm doing today how is it going to make it better how is it going to nourish me how is it going to enable my career how is it going to make me look at something in a very different light so i need that line to be translated to in the past i was doing it in this way my job we are bringing in all these digital tools so it's going to enable this it's going to free up your time so that you can now start looking at strategic thinking so you need to bring it to for people to understand it from their context so that's just a small example of where it could be relevant how that translation from something which is very abstract you take it and make it very specific and specific to each role so can i say that business storytelling while the term sounds quite intimidating <laughs> is actually trying to make people who are involved understand more of how it impacts them or how it helps them or how it influences them in in ways that they can understand rather than ways that we want to tell that tell it to them right can can yes. i can we say it that way yes definitely it's like contextualizing it and using this as a communication tool because you want to communicate a lot of different things say for instance you know you want to say oh we need to be really good at thinking out of the box very cliche right yeah like i rolling think- cliche right <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I think really unraveling those jargons and communicating in a way that people connect and hence will move to action. You want people to be in that action space. You want that emotion being geared and people to move to action, not just look at conclusions. Oh yeah, I get it. I look at this data and I get it that this is how it's supposed to be. That's a conclusion. But you need them to go beyond that conclusion and move to action. and that's what the stories really do it's a invitation to look at it from somebody's perspective so you started the business in 2014 yes and you've been teaching businesses how to tell their own stories better or at least communicate better let's let's put it this way because yes. communications is really the basis of it all right we want yes. people to communicate better yes, so absolutely. when you first started your business Was it hard selling this idea to the people who were supposed to make the decisions to say yes we're we're going to go with business storytelling? Yeah. I think you never sell in a way you never sell business storytelling. What you're selling to them is how their business is going to get that insight 
and what's the outcome going to be from a business point of view so like we say you know it's like when you take a tool like say just for example mbti or any of the assessment tools or anything you're not just selling an assessment i think that's very transactional that they might as well go online and click a package and buy it what you're telling them is this is the insight it's going to give to your team and your team is going to work better and so the outcome is going to be different all the targets that you had in mind for your team is going to be unlocked using this and i'm just using that as an example i mean not a big believer in a lot of the assessment tools but i'm just saying that it's it's not something that you just buy off the rack that's not what you're selling so you're not selling business storytelling so you are actually going to the team and organizations to say what are the problems you're trying to solve what's working well for you where are you getting stuck and what is preventing you from achieving the biggest success that you can achieve so and hence unlock your team's potential hidden or otherwise how do you do that and using stories as a tool to really do that unlocking so say for i always think about uh, you know atul gawande and i'm sure you uh, read his uh, content he wanted to really look at hospitals to follow something at times when infections were going up at that time the surgeons were not very careful about washing hands believe it or not <laughs> and it seems really odd to say that now right even say it i'm feeling oh, okay is this even a content but simple things are sometimes hard to follow because you have a habit which is a way of doing things and you don't do it any other way so the whole thing was it is how do you create the solution so what he did was he persuaded the whole hospital leadership in pittsburgh and this was 2005 to look at hospital infections in a very different way so they would have 30 minutes small group discussions with healthcare workers at every level so let it be the people who are serving food let it be the janitors nurses everybody would have these conversations and they would say we are here because the hospital is having this problem and we want to know what you know about solving it so they didn't go with a know it all approach they didn't say that you know we need to what do you say we need to blue ocean thinking blue sky thinking whatever that kind of thing he just said we have this problem we want to know your solution what are your ideas how do you think we can solve it and so when they went in with that kind of humility and openness ideas came pouring out people said oh you know what if we carefully keep the hand gel dispensers where they were missing we were like can we put them there can we ensure that it is can we follow a flow where people when they remove their gowns and gloves it is right there and they brought in all these small nuances which made it different so now when you take this as an example and you want to go to an organization and talk about change in the flow of work you don't need to get preachy and say you have to do it this way you have to do it that way you can say let me give you an example in a hospital in pittsburgh this happened and then you can leave them open with a question saying what do you think happened after that and let the people figure it out for themselves and i think one of the disservice sometimes we do is we think that the audience may not know it but the audience they know it your stakeholders know it sometimes the solutions are inside you just need to activate a way to bring them out so really using some of these examples in a organizational context to facilitate a, a conversation so sometimes of late i'm thinking that i should change my title to a conversation catalyst because that's what i want to do i want to ask these questions and have people unravel it for themselves because they are the experts a lot of times when i walk into a bank while i've worked in banking people who are handling the jobs day to day they are the experts i work with manufacturing industry they know their industry in and out so i do feel that you have it inside yourself sometimes situations prevent you from sharing things i'm just uh, thinking of another example so when clarol the brand i don't know if i've mentioned it to you the one that does herbal essence the shampoo brand the shampoo yeah 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 
So in 2001, when Steve Sadoff took over as a CEO, that brand was going through a big dip. Today, we think about Herbal Essence as, you know, that flowery, creative brand, so many innovative formulations and all that. At that time, they weren't creating anything. They had just gone through a slump. So Steve goes around in the office and he looks at the technical team, the chemical team, the formulation team, and he's asking them, hey, what happened? We were like top of the world. We were like doing all this well. What happened? What happened to us? And one of the formulation guys, he just pulled his draw in front of him from the table and he said, this is where the formulations are lying. Nobody wants to look at it. So sometimes you have to find a way to create that atmosphere. And that's what Steve said. Oh my God, people are not listening to ideas. So you need to find a way to create that environment where people's ideas are listened to. And then you can unlock that potential within an organization. Okay, I love that term, conversation catalyst. That's one. <laughs> that's one. Okay, I think that sounds very intriguing. I think maybe you should use it more and more in your work. Just say someone comes to you and says, Sundari, we definitely need your help or we definitely need what you can do for us. So what does that process look like? Misconversation mm-hmm. catalyst. Yeah. <laughs> I like this. Now, I think I've created a new <laughs> thing. For, and thanks for putting your seal of approval on it, Krista. <laughs> it, make, it makes me think that maybe it's the right direction. Yeah. I think typically um, when uh, clients uh, reach out for these kind of conversations, I go into the whole discovery mode. It's almost like a coaching conversation, you know, where you go and sit with the client and you talk to them and ask them questions, which will help them state what they are looking for and clarify the issue. And in that process of trying to tell something, the clarity may be sometimes just unlocked within themselves as well. And then you see who are the stakeholders, who else do you need to involve in the conversation? Because you can't just look one side of the view. You need to do a 2D, 3D, 4D kind of a view to understand the con. Organizations are complex in that sense. Uh, Everything is interlinked and you need to find a way to really look at it. So we were working with a manufacturing company and the initial remit was actually to work with the leadership team on helping them strategize better because there was some feeling that while they were all leaders in their specific fields, there was a lot of silo decision making that was happening. That was an overwhelming feeling that the CEO had. Now, I don't know if that was what was happening. So the CEO had engaged me to work with just the senior leadership team to unlock this. Now, in the course of the conversation, first, of course, I had the conversation with the CEO saying, so what is happening because of that? Because of the siloed, if if it is siloed and it's still working well, uh, do you need to change it uh, at all? You need to ask those questions as well. Sometimes the questions are, somebody says, you know, I was almost going to give up. Then the immediate question is, why didn't you give up? So that makes them go back and actually think. Oh, yeah. Why didn't I give up? So there's something in you that keeps you going, right? So really looking at, so after the CEO conversations, then we brought in the leadership team and I had one-on-ones with each of them to understand a little bit about business. And in the meantime, I was doing all the research about that particular industry, the nature of the industry, how it works, talk to a few people who are working in the industry. And these are all just my own background research. Because obviously we need not be in each and every industry that we are working in, but you need to get a sense of that industry before you can even go and work with them. So doing all that background research, but at the same time speaking to the different stakeholders. And as a process of that discovery, things unraveled. And then you come up with a what you think can be a plan. Then you bounce it off all the, the entire team. Then you actually do an alignment exercise. And you work with the entire team first before you work at individual things. So you come up with a double prong thing. Some of it is something that happens at a leadership level. Some of it happens at a coaching level, individual coaching level. It could be that somebody is just, for example, somebody is just keeping information very close to themselves. How long is the duration of working with your client? I think a good engagement would be something on six months to one year. Uh, because it's a process. 
it is not a you know touch and tick mark again there are clients sometimes will come and ask you can you come and do a one hour session for all of us what is going to change in one hour and i think in this age of a little bit of that instant gratification mode also pushing the clients to look at it more long term as something that will stand for the organization and for the work and not looking at something that i'm going to be i mean you you know it's like a consultant is paid by the hour and you go and do something for the hour but that's not the point right it's like how do you ex- it also help them to think from that position to explore to experiment to be optimistic and carry on a journey it's not something that you just want to do transactionally and leave them with sometimes that process can take a longer time i mean you work with a lot of clients convincing the clients that you need to be in it for the long run so that they can be in it for even longer run and building that capacity within the organization to take it through i mean you want to work long enough to make yourself redundant so it means that you have a lot of interesting how should i say interesting learnings right even as you you know work with your clients because every industry is unique and every industry also presents their own of circumstances that need you to come in to help coach them bring no, them totally. through the entire process totally totally and i think that is the joy of uh, working with uh, clients and being a consultant i think the learning for me has been immense the access to industries and teaching as well so that's another vertical that i'm involved with and while teaching others and i think adam grand mentioned it in hidden potential teaching others builds your competence whereas it's coaching others that elevates your confidence so really working with the teams learning from them i mean one i get a ringside view of so many different industries which if i had a regular corporate job i'd be working in one industry right so this ringside view the thought process of leaders you know see your thought process ceo is sometimes a lonely journey so having that conversation with them to understand what is the thought process what are all the other dimensions that they are grappling with so when i was in a corporate job i looked at my job and my role and my finance role i didn't possibly think about what other businesses are going through you know the empathy from the other side and all that but when you look at it from a ceo's perspective you need to balance a lot of these different interests and that is great learning for me for sure you know personal growth exponential growth yeah because it always sounds very enjoyable because you're going to a business not only are you helping them but really you're understanding them and it's like really like getting a personal mba right every time you get in there <laughs> great way of putting it absolutely it's like you know not just the inside view and i think it can be very inspiring personally as well one of my really early m- memories of my college days was uh, when one day when i was doing my bachelor's in commerce our head of the department she walked into our class and said there's a conference coming to town it's by this management association who'd like to volunteer and i quickly put my hand up and i had no clue what we had to do it was not the social media world at that time so you know there was no there were hand flyers <laughs> in that sense so the conference was at this five star hotel in uh, chennai and i had never been inside a five star hotel so i was already really of you know the plush carpet chairs with ribbons huge chandeliers and all that all i had to do was to ensure people got water and notebooks and pencils on their table that's all i had to do but that access gave me the ringside view to all the senior industry leaders who were there in the room and one of the female ceos which was very rare at that time she was just getting into her family business she said that you don't have to and and clearly i'm paraphrasing and my memory is not that good uh, for that long back this is like you know in the 80s late 80s she said you don't need to love uh, money to work at a business you need to have a passion for growing that business and that immediately i became very firm that i want to do my mba i want to get into business i want to look at it and in my family 
for generations nobody has ever run a business on their own <laughs> we just not don't have the business dna in us <laughs> so i still went into a corporate role and a corporate job and i think that gave me the grounding to really look at leaning in on all those experiences today when i try to run my own fledgling business in that sense you know it's but that passion came from that so that access that you get conversational access and the network access is something invaluable yeah i i truly truly resonate with that because i think like even for me having these conversations with all these wonderful women across asia on my podcast gives me access to some of their insights their learnings sometimes they are mistakes sometimes they are failures sometimes things that they would have probably not even remembered had i not asked that question like they were like wow no one ever asked that question before so then in your work probably there's also people who are resistant to what you bring to the table and i'm sure that is common across all industries right change yes. is very difficult for a lot of people how do you deal with people who are skeptical or people who have a lot of resistance when you say here's someone who we've brought in to help us with mm-hmm. this challenge that we have in our in our company mm-hmm. how do you let this people who are totally resistant to change don't want to change at all so yeah. sundari this is this is your area of expertise <laughs> to okay. to show us like how do we actually overcome things like that because in every everyone's business i'm sure there's someone who will be resistant to something yeah so resistance actually have faced at two levels one is even agreeing to that concept so this is even before you get the deal <laughs> you know oh we don't need story storytelling as a tool we are happy with our data we you know we are happy while equally understanding that the insights are not coming so you have resistance at the entry level itself and this i mentioned even about hong kong as an organizer as a place as a country where a special administrative region <laughs> <laughs> as a place where you know where there's a lot of transactions happening people like to put their head down and uh, get about doing things there's a resistance at that level itself in my initial years i would definitely try to literally bang my head against it and try to convince people and all that but over a period of time i've just let my work show the answer to that so i've not gone and really reached out to anybody who just has no belief in it and that's taken some time because you need to be confident with yourself and what you do for you to get that and that's a journey for all entrepreneurs about everything you know when people you know totally resist the idea you can try to convince them you can explain it to them but like as it said you don't change somebody's mind with another idea you can only try to influence them with a good story so you need to create those good story your case stories and examples of success stories and things like that within an organization is the other part what you were referring to in terms of you know you're brought in as an external resource who's going to come and change things what are you going to bring that you know nobody none of us knew before kind of thing that kind of a resistance I've been quite lucky not to face it very obviously but how it will turn up is in terms of the work and the output that has to happen there'll be no change and that's one way of measuring that there is a resistance right when there is no change happening in a certain parameter in a certain industry one thing i've always tried to do is to first build bonds and connections and understand people's motivations why each of us do what we do sometimes may seem you know like for instance you mentioned about your podcast saying that it started as a pandemic child <laughs> yes <laughs> <a> pandemic baby <laughs> really your motivation at that time might have been something different and it might have evolved over a period of time as well and as you do it definitely and while your basic values remain the same your motivation might have changed Oh, I'm getting these stories. I'm getting these connections. I'm learning from this. What else can I do? What more can I do? Can I write a book? Whatever the thought process is, it changes, right? It adds on. So, understanding people's motivations is really important. 
before you go and try to you know do some band-aid and patchwork on what is working and what's not working so some of these conversations and that is why communication is such a critical piece if you're running a project if you're a project manager if you're running an organization it's all about communication how are you communicating in written form in verbal form how are you relating so i try to work with people individually and teams in groups small groups to understand their motivations and that has really helped to see what what is that who moved my chi not who moved my chi but what really pushes them to do what they do in that sense so really looking at what drives people and it need not be the same thing what we talked about the digital thing it may not be wanting to make the company the best digital company that ever was that may not be that person's motivation yeah. when you get into it people's motivations may differ from what they originally thought yes they were telling yeah. you right yes in the i mean that's why i was using podcast your podcast as a easy example might have started with a particular reason you know this is something i always wanted to do maybe i can grapple maybe i have more time now so i research on how what does it mean to run a podcast what can i do oh let me start once one episode and see sometimes we keep that that low bar and today you're at season 7 right yeah, <laughs> uh, season 7 and that motivation i'm sure has built on it's also changed a little bit in the direction of how we want to guide it and what you want to do the confidence that you feel in doing it so helping people also with the small wins is really important for them to get that buy in once they have that small win it is also you know self reinforcing oh that seems to work let me try and I was talking to one CFO who wanted to change something like this with her team where how they were accounting for some uh, transactions was very different and she wanted them to try it differently and there was like big resistance we have always done it like this that's a standard thing right for any change thing so they had one hour of chat two hours of chat it was not going anywhere so what she did was she just said okay why don't we try it for the next one month and let's see how it goes let's see what the learnings are for both of us and that was a easier ask so asking for that small thing sometimes the pilot or proof of concept if you have to say and that helped and in this particular case that scheme really worked and that person got totally sold and he said okay we will extend it not just here can we try it for other regions so then you can scale very easily because there somebody was tried it it's worked well So again, looking for some of the small wins has helped. Yeah, that's a great example because a lot of times, like when we say resistant, we always feel that a person is resistant forever. But if we can just show that person that there's a small win here, if we can get over that barrier, and the person starts to believe in it because they can see the outcome, or they can see okay. something that they like, then they start thinking, hmm. Maybe it's not too bad an idea. Maybe we should try this way, you know, instead of the old way that we used to do. That's a really good point about you know starting with small little doable pilot projects to get people to slowly acclimatize <laughs> to the the big idea. Yes. yes, yes. So Sundari, I wanted to go back into this story of yours because, and this is a personal story of yours, right? So you talked about Chennai. You talk about India, but you're in Hong Kong right now. So I was working with the FMCG company, uh, Universe branch called uh, Lipton in India. And after working in finance for some time there, there was that moment when I felt the areas that were coming to me for work were not where I wanted to be. <laughs> so one day, after having a really frustrating meeting at a sales tax office in Greens Road in Chennai. I walked into my boss's room next day it was a Saturday and I just put in my resignation letter <laughs> and my boss was like what what's happening here and he said I'm keeping this aside come and have breakfast with me tomorrow and he took me to a really nice hotel where you know he said let's talk about it what's happening and I I was thinking for a minute you know oh I'm going to this hotel but like it's such a tense conversation <laughs> and in those days having tissue papers were not very common but he took out a paper tissue paper napkin and he put it out there and he took a pen and drew a x axis and y axis and he said 
you're like a flight which has taken off without a destination in mind. Do you have a job in hand? And I didn't. I had just quit out of frustration. And the kind of things that of course you do when you're like young and foolish, so to say. <laughs> and I he said, okay, what is happening with you? What? And he asked for the details and all that. And we had this conversation and he said, I understand where you're coming from. And I see that you have a lot of different, you know, competencies and things that you may want to work on, which this role is currently not offering you. Go and explore, check out and then come back to me. And he said, I'm tearing your resignation letter. It's not that I'm not listening to you, but you go and explore. So I went out and spoke to a few people. And I didn't speak to enough number of people, I feel, in sheer retrospect, but I did speak to a, a few people. I applied for jobs and I got a couple of offers and then I made a move to ANZ Greenleys, as it was called, the bank in uh, India, to work in relationship management because I just felt that whole human connect, which a traditional finance job was offering, was not my niche at that time. So I went back and gave, and so he was, so I'm eternally grateful for to him. And he's still my mentor and he's still somebody that I chat with and we send messages to each other. One of the most humble persons that I know. So I learned that also from him still. Like recently he was presenting at a, he was talking about, you know, women in boats at a seminar. And after the seminar got over, he actually messaged me and said, did that go well? Was that okay? And here's this really senior person having that humility to ask that question. So is he something that I'm totally inspired with and, you know, inspired by and somebody I follow. So I went and joined ANZ and that was the banking uh, life. And I think I really thrived there. The kind of people contact that I could really benefit from and also work in the areas. There are people that I've worked with at that time that I'm still very much in touch with. Same with, of course, Unilever, Lipton as well. I'm very much in touch with them. That changed the trajectory of what finance could be, you know, really layers of finance, right? On areas of that you could be working in. And then I had my uh, first child. And that was again another moment for, you know, India at that time didn't have any care infrastructure at all, other than you employing somebody at home, but that person need not be reliable. So as a first time parent, as a young mother, I, my husband and I, we were talking with each other and we said, how do we leave her and go to work? What is the setup possible? So we had some temporary people coming in. I was not happy. So I had my parents and my in-laws coming in by turns to looking to look after the baby. And I knew that was not sustainable. For some people, it can work. And that's normally the model that works in India. <laughs> but for some people, it need not work. And I could see that like my in-laws were struggling. My mother would come sometimes and leave my father alone at home. And, you know, they were also just getting in the retirement age. Sometimes it was just too... I thought, no, we need to take a grip on what we want to do. We can't just... While it's parents and they will go out of the way to help us, we need to figure it out. And I think the care infrastructure is something is still pretty much lacking. Not just in India, in a lot of different places, but definitely for me at that time, it was not good enough. And I remember one day I came back from work at around 10 o'clock in the night and my daughter hadn't gone to sleep. My husband was trying to put her to sleep and she hadn't gone to sleep because she wanted to see me. And she was like one. And that was a very nerve wracking moment for me as a parent. I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know what to do. So we had this discussion with my husband and my husband was getting a job offer to move to Bahrain. And at the time I was doing, according to him, way better than he was doing. And he said, you know, you don't need to leave this. We'll figure it out. But I was very clear that I didn't want a long distance marriage. I wanted time with my daughter and I just felt that this is the time when I need to take a call. So I go into my senior leader's office and that's the time ANZ and Standard Chartered are also merged in India. So I go into his office and I tell him that, you know, do you think it's possible that I can do job sharing with somebody? And he said, job sharing? What does that word even mean? 
I mean, these were concepts that nobody had heard of in India. I had just read it in a book. I had also not seen it in action, <laughs> so I was. It was very thinking. brave of you to go and approach a, a yeah, senior but, and ask about that. I mean, we had really good relationships with our, you know, with our managers. They were they were most approachable, most friendly. They wanted to set you up for success. So, but it just didn't exist as a exist as a concept, right? So there was a he said, "Go and drop share and forget it." Like, and then I realized I had to take a call. It was my decision finally. You know, obviously everybody around me might have geared up to support me. Had I said no, I want to continue working and I want to do this and I want to do that. I said no. I'm not for a long distance marriage. I'm not for you know for incomplete setups in terms of childcare. I want to know that my child is taken care of. So I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to come with you to Bahrain. And I had to even look up where that place was because I'd heard of Dubai, I'd heard of Saudis. I had to search the map, and you didn't have all these zooms and all that. Like you know, internet itself. We would go to an internet cafe and look at internet. There was no. We didn't have a computer. There was no Google Map, right? <laughs> no Google Map, no computer at home, no mobile phones of anything which would be smart. Huh? So I had to look up and I said, "Okay," but I had that, you know. We have this word in Tamil called "kurit dairyam," which is called blind confidence. I had that always in me, thanks to my mother. <laughs> I think <laughs> I said, "I'll go there and figure out something," and then we made that move to Bahrain. And in Bahrain, I freelance for some time. and that's also where the oh freelancing is good you have so much agency over your time it's worth continuing to explore that option you don't need to be a so to say corporate slave so find out you know what else you can do so i explored a few of those options and we outgrew that tiny dot in about 4 years 5 years and he moved to hong kong and that's how i came to hong kong he moved to hong kong on work and i was ready to move out of bahrain by that time saying it's really restrictive let's try to find a place where both of us can grow wings and fly more freely and that's what hong kong was <laughs> so you really made hong kong your home can i say that absolutely 17 years here i feel it's a place which has so much to offer but it's also a place where you can be on your own if you want to you can be with a group that you want to while it is a finance i've managed to explore other places like i do pottery so that gives me a chance to go and actually meet a totally different group of people otherwise you hang around with even if i say that the boring finance types <laughs> <laughs> so the banking just, people <laughs> the, the banking, banking people <laughs> <laughs> sometimes then the conversations are only banking but uh, you know so it just i think it gave me a way to be a bit more local I play tennis that gave me a totally different group of people amazing people that you can learn from and you know they say you are a product of the five people around you so having the ability to find those five people and hong kong has very good care infrastructure in place because the government also ma- you know really mandates some of the regulation so i have somebody who i'm eternally thankful to who helps me run my home which means i can grow and go and grow my own wings and i can fly and so as much as the family and the husband and everything else she's also the wind beneath my wings she's the you know reason why we can go and do what we want to do because she does all that support so really grateful to hong kong provides all that kind of infrastructure everything happens by clockwork of course if you don't tick one of the boxes then things just paralyze and stop <laughs> because it can't happen any other way but it's 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 been a great journey a great place to bring up the kids for the kids to feel comfortable be on their own grow up and you know today for them if they have to think okay i'm going back home it would they will think hong kong they won't think india <laughs> And how many children do you have now after yeah. that? that, that <laughs> yeah, <first> <laughs> two two kids. Uh, they are twenty four and twenty one, and both wow. of them are uh, studying in the uh, US. Uh, so wow. we are empty nesters, uh, to use a word. <laughs> uh, and but that uh, also gives you more freedom to also 
launch into your own consultancy, do things that you like to do. And I read this about you on your website is that tennis lessons were your thing. Both pottery and tennis really made a difference to discovering. I always played a lot of sports in my school days. in college a little bit and then i was doing bachelor's in commerce i was doing cost accounting training and i was preparing for my mba that pretty much left zero time for sports or anything i was the typical asian nerdy kid <laughs> you were the a person right <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> <laughs> but when when i was doing my mba that's when i discovered uh, table tennis and in general because you played sports I think the hand-eye coordination, wanting to play a lot of games, was always there. Played it again, then you get into work, work life. Your initial years, you are investing yourself hundred percent. If you come back from office at two a.m. in the morning, you are not thinking tennis or table tennis or anything else, right? Though we would have lunch hour table tennis at our head office in Lipton in Bangalore, and I would love playing at that time. But it's just lunch hour, five minute kind of thing. So when I came to Hong Kong, I said two things to myself: Hong Kong is the place where ping pong is like so famous. So I must go and up my ping pong skills. So I got myself a coach, and like you know, he was training some of their national players, and he was coaching at one of the sports centers nearby. So I went and coached with him, <laughs> just to you know, I need to improve my forehand, I need to improve my backhand, that kind of thing. Not that I got to any level, but it was for my own personal growth. And I think some of the learning, I feel, it's like almost saying, no knowledge is wasted. The learning is for the learning's sake, for you to really set some goals for yourself and work at it. You know, so that was that was great. And then I meandered into tennis and racket sports. You know, and tennis is, I think, it gave me a great family here in Hong Kong. Some. People that I played with over the years are now good friends. They are all over the world. Like I say, we share a mutual passion for Rafael Nadal, and we are like always talking. Did you see that? Did you know what happened and all that? And we are eagerly waiting for his comeback and all that. So I think it just builds these lovely connections, which transcends uh, culture, race, nationality, gender, anything. You know, and I think these are some of the unifying factors. And that definitely, Hong Kong is the place that gave it to me. You were talking about personal goals just now. Have you had any new personal goals since you know taking up tennis and table tennis, and of course pottery? Actually, I have more uh, personal business goals, and I will tell you why I'm talking about the business goals because there was this, this article which talked about stages of women's life. It said in the twenties, it's this; in the thirties, in the forties, and it's fifties, and then it stopped at fifty. And it talked about literally almost like self-actualization after fifty or something like that. Now today we are living in the hundred-year-old life, right? Average life expectancy, fingers crossed, has really gone up. Uh, so I do want to think of myself as a multi-potentialite. I have a portfolio career which I think I've carefully built. Like one is the consulting leg, the second is the teaching uh, part, which I'm absolutely enjoying, and I really want to build on that. And the third part is around uh, coaching, mentoring, doing work with NGOs. I'm on the board of an NGO, and I'm on the exco of another NGO, and I really want to widen this to see what else is possible. So if your life has just gone in a certain, I mean. I wouldn't have thought when I was working in Lipton that I'd go and work with a bank. Then I wouldn't have thought I would go and consult with a Basel II trainer. Then I consulted for an NGO. I worked with an NGO. Then I started my business. I closed that and I started another business. I wouldn't have thought of this at all. So it is sort of been like a jungle gym, climbing here, there, everywhere kind of thing. And I want to really explore and see what else and what more. And Luckily, I still have that aspiration and I have that drive to explore. And I also have, and this I was telling with some of my mentees yesterday when we were catching up, that I have a personal board of directors who have been roped in. They've been voluntold to be my <laughs> board of directors, <laughs> with whom I have these conversations. They are people who know me for like thirty years. 
they have great dreams for me more than i have for myself and they believe in me and love me and trust me at the same time they are okay to ask me that uncomfortable question and i'm okay to listen to that uncomfortable question coming from them so i'm really looking at exploring okay these are three verticals which are working really well i'm advising consulting writing so writing is something that i'm getting a little bit more into trying to do collaborative articles with people who are in a similar field so i'm working on that so that's honing a new skill because i love telling stories and telling anecdotes and sharing examples and i'm building my you know i i do a video a week on so i when i say i help leaders and teams on the being more human at work i do it two ways one is the consulting work the other is by sharing those examples small anecdotes examples giving them a context and showing them how to use it at a workplace so i'm really look at that sort of a cusp of exploring a little bit more and i have a few conversations set up with my board directors <laughs> to help and me how, and how that. did you get your personal board of directors yeah so these are people that i know for like i said for 30 years some of them are people that i've worked with in my initial job some of them are people who studied with me at my mba school some of them i met in hong kong who there's a connection the people that you chat with on a topic you know you oh i read about this leadership article and this is that and i think one of the things about building a personal brand as well is for me i've said that this is my thing business storytelling is my thing so every time somebody sees an article around it every time i speak in a podcast i'm talking about it so people forward me content so there's somebody who really is a senior leader he's now teaching at another university he's always sharing content with me i read this and i thought of you so it's almost like a word association that happens and this is something i tell people who are trying to build their personal brand itself is how are you introducing yourself especially when you make switch between careers so go and do that reintroduction so there is a word association with you it may not be one word it could be two words three words things that you do you know but people should know clearly what they can identify with you and that's how work also comes my way so people see my content on linkedin and then reach out and say oh i see you've done this i see you've done this can you do this so and that's useful right it's that word association is useful but the you know the people who are you know the board of directors they definitely then come on and share things with me and tell me and oh why aren't you exploring this no 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 i don't want this i don't want to no that's black hat thinking come on let's talk about it so really somebody who pushes you gives you constructive feedback in a way that you can take it and you know that you trust that person so these are people who been volunteered to this position over a period of time by me just calling them and asking them for advice constantly giving them a situation being mindful of their time and their life but giving them saying i'm really stuck with this i need to have a conversation to help me thinking partner could be another word i call it my personal board of directors but it's anybody right we all have different people that we go to for different things and i'm sure you yeah. do too Yeah I think that's really an excellent strategy especially if sometimes you overthink like for myself I think sometimes I overthink a, a topic or an idea so it's always good to have someone to bounce an idea off or just to share a quick chat so they can get clear and I think that's sometimes why we need the personal board of directors or thinking partner as you said and and that actually helps us grow And I think that's what we're looking for, right? The growth, yeah. knowing where we are and whether we are still headed in the right direction. Yes. So what is one of the craziest things you've ever done in your life? <laughs> This may not sound crazy to a lot of people, but for me it was very crazy because I grew up in Chennai like I said, so near the beach. So we would go to the beach, I would stand in the waves, I would walk on the beach, that was okay. But I never learned swimming. and i didn't know to swim i never thought about it in chennai when i grew up it was called madras and like you know people didn't send their girls to guy instructors for learning swimming there were not that many pools except in clubs and some really posh hotels so i never learned that 
then when after i had my kids i kept telling them that you know i put the kids in the water when they were 3 months 6 months they were in the water because i said this is something it's a life skill they need to learn and the compound that we stayed in in bahrain had this gorgeous huge pool the instructor lived in the same compound as well so it was very convenient i said it's a life skill you have to learn so this went on for some time till one day i decided after we moved to hong kong i decided to put my kids on a high boat diving class because our club had high boat diving and there was a russian who was a i think was a olympic medalist or high boat diver who was appointed as a coach so one uh, easter break i said good this is an activity for the kids to do let me put them and they were really small at that time so they were in protesting otherwise i wouldn't have got anything done <laughs> so i sent them to the class and the whole thing about high boat diving is that once you go to the top and you stand there if you face even a moment of fear everybody behind you is going to face it if you go there and hesitate and say oh i can't jump it's go- that fear is going to come through so the coach was very conscious of that and he would ensure that in case he fi- found that somebody was hesitant he would hold them and he would do the jump so they don't feel alone about taking that leap off the boat so he was supporting them but he wouldn't let them hesitate and that can be it's a debatable uh, thing i'm not a coach for swimming or diving so i don't know so my kids were like really unhappy about that <laughs> though they did finish the thing they protested and all they finished it they just turned around and said me you're telling us all the time that we need to learn this we should go this why aren't you swimming why aren't you learning swimming so i said okay that's a good point but i was scared to be honest i was really scared of the thought of swimming i hadn't done it at all so this was when i was like almost more than 40 so i go i sign up for private lessons in the club and my lesson is right after a 6 month old baby who's happily swimming in the water right after that is my class and i'm screaming and bawling <laughs> but at the end of it i managed to swim the width of a pool without panicking without drowning <laughs> or whatever and for me that was a very brave thing to do and it was a crazy thing to do <laughs> i don't i i won't go and do swimming now anywhere uh, i won't do it but i thought it was i told myself i was being very brave <laughs> but that really is a, a great story you know because learning to swim at 40 that that's something that most people will not probably attempt at all because they probably think oh you know why why would i even need to swim or learn how to swim right i'm i'm sure you know a lot of these things go into people's minds but yeah what a great story i mean it's really not that crazy but maybe it was crazy to you it felt crazy why would you want to go and put yourself through this and like make a make a fool of yourself make a scene there <laughs> it felt crazy to me <laughs> i mean it was not crazy in the sense of you know oh i went and did bungee jumping kind of thing and all that i jumped over a plane <laughs> yeah i jump over a plane kind of a thing I, again i don't think i'm ever going to do that <laughs> so sunari after all that you have said uh, about the business that you're running right now your consultancy the teaching and even the mentoring right you you have mentees writing wow you have a you have a lot on your plate and even though you call yourself an empty nester i'm sure there's never a dull day in your life right i'm sure you either filled it with your hobbies things that you want to do or the things that you're doing for your business so what's a piece of advice that you could offer someone who is probably starting a business or probably is a consultant in some place in asia or probably even beyond asia who's mm-hmm. starting out and unsure or perhaps you know trying to find that specific area that they could really excel in what would mm-hmm. your advice to them be because mm-hmm. i see that you have found your niche and you are thriving and prospering in your niche so yeah. you must have something <laughs> that you've learned along the years 
<laughs> lot of trial and error krista you know that <laughs> i would say and um, and this is i mean recently somebody who's in a corporate job actually called to say that you know how the job will be there but i just feel there's so much in me which is which i'm not exploring and this is also the type of coaching so after having a few chats with him understanding his background and what he likes to do and all that i just feel you need to create a canvas where you try a lot of different things if you restrict yourself and say i'm going to try this and just this and stay there not only are you living within your comfort zone you're not exploring your full potential which may be totally hidden unknown to you as well so sometimes your friends your advisors anybody can be good mirrors for you so talk to them and talk about what are all the other things that you could be doing and i would i mean i was telling him for instance that go and try teaching somewhere try teaching at a school try teaching at a college do it once a week do it once a month just go and try it and you try and explore it for see and see how are you feeling about it how are the others receiving you what do you need to change you won't get it right uh this whole teaching thing just came upon me i didn't i mean we always think that uh, especially after having dealt with the kids you feel i don't want to teach anybody <laughs> you know this like you're done kind of thing so a friend of mine reached out and said i'm doing this course with product managers and i think storytelling really is a good mix on how as product managers you can be great storytellers so can you do one session for me it'll be online it's this so i went through actually a lot of discussion for him to understand the course that he was running what he was doing who is it for and again that background research really helped and i did a one hour session and this was 2017 18 kind of thing and i got really great feedback i saw that i loved it and i was bringing in my facilitator and coach hat into the teaching so it was not as a teacher as i remembered my college teachers as it was different because once you know something is very difficult for you to unknow that skill so you would ask questions and i'm sure you you do this as well i mean you're a great podcast host because you know how to bring out the nuances you know what are the right questions you do your research and as i can see today for sure <laughs> and that helps right that brings a totally different touch and once i started doing it then somebody else asked so the first two assignments i just did it pro bono to get a sense of what it is and, and i realized oh this feels good and i also realized that maybe it's not something i might want to do every day because there's a different kind of a discipline to it and a different kind of preparation to it i had my other roles and parts so i slowly grew into that role and now it is part of one of my verticals which i regularly deliver programs on strategic uh, storytelling to different universities work with the product managers at a tech fellowship program and so on and so forth so that's so I explore it you know i go with an open mind and explore it and sometimes as they say a lot of the things are more in your imagination than in your reality so that overthinking part what you were saying i think having somebody to bounce it off gives you that scope to go and really explore and then take it almost like a sorry i have to do a pottery analogy take it almost like a clay sculpture so you have all these molds of clay you have this lumps of clay with you you're chipping it away to figure out what's underneath so it's almost like sculpting so you're trying this this is not working you're chipping then you've chipped it off then you say no i want to add a little bit more clay because this part has to be a bit more rounded so i had a little bit more clay so it's literally like going through those iterations giving yourself the permission to go there learn fail and it's okay but you're widening the scope of everything that you're doing and i think that's what has really worked for me to be brave to try different things I hadn't ever done pottery except for seeing people do pottery on the streets in India and people like just throw it so it seems like something that potters do to you know for water pots and things like that I didn't know it was an art I didn't know it was something more than that and I'm still learning you know but you have to go and try 
So that really is something that I believe in too because I think that unless you try it, you'll never know whether it fits you, your personality, whatever that you have in your life right now because a person in their 20s and 30s, uh, their time, their resources could be very different. But even giving yourself that, like you said, that time to go and teach once a week, try something and then have this ability to learn from that experience and take that and ask yourself, does it fit me? Or whether does it fit what I want to do in my life? And then from there, branch out into exploring. And I think life would be so much better and happier if we all could do that, right? Just to explore. Mm-hmm. I mean, we'll look at the world like a child would look at the world. Yes, with the absolute, with curiosity. And, and storytelling actually stems from that curiosity and listening. Are you keen to know what is making this person do what they're doing? And then are you willing to listen when they speak? So this whole thing of, I mean, when you're talking, it's just like evoking so much of emotion about what you're wanting to do, right? Wanting to explore that areas that you want to see. And some of it will not work out. And that's fine. And permission, to <laughs> permission, permission to fail. Permission to Give yourself the permission to fail. It's not others giving you the permission. It's okay to try and fail. And it's not a failure. I mean, I don't even want to call it a failure. It's learning. Yeah. So, Sundari, I had such a wonderful time talking to you today. But before we go, where can people connect with you? And I know I want to use the word connect. It's not find you. <laughs> I just want to connect <laughs> with you so because much. I know. I, I think that is the word for us today in this episode is connection and we feel connected to each other so I want people to connect with Sundari so where can they connect with you? LinkedIn would be the best place and I'm sure we can put in my website on the show notes or something but LinkedIn would be the great best place to find me. I haven't found any other Soundari Mukherjee with the spelling on LinkedIn yet. <laughs> you do have a very unique name, both, you know, the first and your last name. Very yeah. unique indeed. Yeah. yeah. So, so LinkedIn thank you is so a great much. place. Thank and you. thank you, Krista. Now, thank you for this platform. Thank you for all that you do. I've been looking at some of the episodes, listening to some of them. I really, especially like what you've written on your website about your podcasting about, you know, the conversations, because you talked about conversations and connect, the stories that make you pause and reflect, the stories that help you unravel the complexity of entrepreneurship and stories that reveal hope, courage and optimism. I love that. Thanks for doing what you do. Thank you. And that concludes our insightful conversation with Sundari Mukherjee, the CEO of Soundbites 11. I hope you've enjoyed this episode where Sundari gave us some insights into the power of business storytelling and leadership. In this episode, a particular highlight that resonated strongly with me is the recognition of the diverse motivations that drive individuals. It's a crucial insight because, as we've learned, not everyone is propelled by the same set of goals or aspirations. Additionally, the emphasis on cultivating small wins emerge as a powerful strategy for gaining buy-in and support, particularly within organizational and team dynamics. The notion of experimenting with a new idea for a defined period, whether a week or a month, offers a practical and effective approach to assessing its viability and impact. Lastly, the profound impact of establishing a personal board of directors, or what Sundari aptly terms as a group of thinking partners, cannot be overstated. The idea underscores the importance of sharing our thoughts and ideas with individuals who truly understand us. Engaging in these discussions not only facilitates valuable insights, but also contributes to the clarity and refinement of our own perspectives. If you found today's episode inspiring, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your feedback means the world to us and helps others discover the incredible Asian women stories shared on Womenpreneur Asia. Stay connected with us on Instagram and on YouTube too. And as always, a big thank you to you for joining us on this journey. I will see you next Friday for another brand new episode.